All right, let's welcome our final storyteller of the evening, Richard Cardillo, everybody. It's uh, September 1980, I'm 22 years old. I'm kneeling in the monastery chapel with my other brother monks ready for morning prayer. And it's my turn to read the gospel reflection of the day. I go up to the front of the room and I open the Bible and I read the passage. Jesus proclaimed, in a little while and you will see me no more. And then in a little while you will see me again. I go back to my pew close my eyes, and have the most profound reflection. Damn, I want some of that magic trick. I can't believe it. Invisibility disappearing. I knew when Maria Von Trapp disappeared into the Alps, she'd go prancing through the Alps. I wanted to disappear from my monastery and go prancing through the Ramble in Central Park. But I didn't, and I wouldn't. Five years previously, I had started this crazy experiment in my life to pray away my gay. And I entered a monastery and took a vow of celibacy. And there was no way I was going to break that vow, ever. I kept channeling the words of Horton. Not the saint, the elephant. (laughs) I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. I will remain faithful 100%. And I tried. There were 17 men in that community. Perhaps the most colorful was Brother Matt. Brother Matt was born and raised in Hell's Kitchen, and he had the scars to prove it on his body. Most people have this image of what a monk is. It's this guy in a long habit with the hands folded and eyes up to heaven, singing Gregorian chant. Brother Matt existed to squash that image. He was loud, he was brash, he was vulgar, he was always in a bad mood. He was a a four-pack-a-day smoker and a a fifth-a-scotch-a-day drinker. (laughs) He followed regularly that special rule in our monastery. Up by six, drunk by six. He was up in that chapel at 6 a.m. every morning looking like shit. But by six in the evening, he was already on his third scotch straight up. He was a hot mess. He was the... He was the business math teacher for all the kids in our school, and they were petrified of him. I was petrified of him. I'd go by his classroom, and I'd hear him screaming. He'd have the cigarette in one hand, days where you could smoke anywhere, and the ruler in the other, and he'd be banging it, saying, God damn it, you lame brains, look! You got your fucking debit column over here, and you got your fucking credit column over there. Now do your best to figure it out the best you can. God damn it! and I tiptoe by. (laughs) We always had this very, very strict regimen of a schedule in our monastery, but we always had free time from after morning prayer on Saturdays to about 6 p.m. that night. And some of the monks would go on a bike ride or a museum or a movie to catch something. Brother Matt would make this big deal about pushing away from the breakfast table and proclaiming, well, monks, I'm the fuck out of here. And he'd disappear. Nobody knew where he went. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I decided the following Saturday I was going to follow him. He leaves the monastery. I'm about 100 steps behind him. I see him going up 125th Street, and at the corner of 125th and Broadway, he goes into the OTB, the off-track betting, betting parlor. I'm like, makes sense. This drunken fool has an addiction to horse race gambling. And I'd look through the window, and I'd see him placing his bed at one window, watching the monitors for the winning at the other window, and then collecting his winnings, which he did every week. He knew what he was doing. He'd sneak out, I'd be behind, he'd come out, I'd be sneaking behind him, and I'd go back down, and always, week after week, right before he went into the monastery, he made this detour, detour, went around Marcus Garvey Park, and he always went into the convent of the Servants of Mary. And I said, makes sense, he's drunk and full with horse race gambling, is hooking up with a nun, too. (laughs) And this experiment that I had in my life of praying away whatever gay was in me, I knew wasn't feeling too good for the future right now. About seven or eight months after I took on that stint as Brother Encyclopedia Brown, (laughs) I decided that I had to figure out what was going on. And I get to the chapel to pray about it at six in the morning, and there's no Brother Matt. T 
teach my classes for the day. At three o'clock that day, our superior brother Joe comes in and he lets us know tragically during the night, brother Matt died in his sleep from a massive heart attack. We knew it was the drinking and the smoking. We knew that. We had a big wake for him and amazingly, hundreds of his former students came and they all said how important a man he was in their life. And all I thought was, if you only knew what I know. About a week after we buried him, the mother superior comes to talk to Brother Joe, and I'm looking at them in the parlor in the monastery, and Brother Joe's face is getting whiter and whiter. And I'm thinking, he just found out what I knew all along. She leaves, and he looks horrible. And I go up to him, I said, Brother Joe, what happened? Can I get you anything? And he's shaking his head. And he's saying, I just don't get it. Mother Superior said, are we going to continue with the weekly donations that Brother Matt made to keep the soup kitchen alive and well? And that's when I realized my repressed brain couldn't even imagine that this man had some dignity or goodness in him. And that's when I also realized that my lifelong experiment to be something that I was not was an abject failure. It's been 25 years since I left the monastery. I don't believe in absolutes anymore, all good, all bad, all one way, all another way. I just don't believe in that. I think it's more nuanced and more complicated, and we're all on that road, and I think what we try to do is just find meaning and find happiness. And I think all of us go to that truism that is so simple, that in our lives, we got our fucking debit column, and we got our fucking credit column. <laughs> And we're just doing our best to figure it out. God damn it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.